the, the common good, I think, is the frame that is going to transform our politics and it's going to move the way that I sometimes think about it is it's going to move from an idea of a social contract to a social covenant, an intergenerational obligation that links us to the greatness um, of our tradition and brings that to bear in standing up to an overmighty market and also an, an overmighty state. And that's obviously the area that I'm in is that I do, I do agree with Tim. So for example, the living wage, that was my thing and you've really got to take some ownership of this, of this. When I was at the very first meeting that established the living wage, it was a really scary thing for me um, my wife's here, we'd just met, you know, it was, um, it, I, I, I was finding, finding my way uh, really, and I was invited to think a retreat on family life, can, if you can imagine such a thing, and I was sure that this was going to be a terrible experience, which was on the whole going to focus on essentially just in a summary not enjoying sex I thought was going to be the overwhelming um, framework of a retreat on family life. For start it was in some horrible sort of office block somewhere in Walthamstow, you know, and I, that didn't conform to my... I'm, I'm present, I'm present, well I remember, you know, two nuns, um, uh, a few lay leaders from, from, from the Catholic Church, uh, a, a couple of people from, from the black church, a Methodist, uh, a couple of Muslims. But what was interesting about the people there who weren't clerics is, th is that they were basically cleaners and cooks and security guards. And when they were talking about family life, they were precisely talking to him in the language that you were just using about the pressure that working two jobs rather than going into welfare was putting on their obligations as parents. And, and this was my transformational moment. I kind of got it. Okay, so, so what is the pressure that the 1979 settlement put on people is that it left people isolated on their own when I think you know a truth that you can't do it on your own, that that leads to an unbearable pressure which is linked to mental health issues, a sense of powerlessness, that a kind of that very characteristic feature of our age, which is a very self-certain arrogance combined with a terrible brittleness and uncertainty, and, and you feel that, that pressure looming. And what came out of this conversation was, was a living wage, that if, if we could get it so that people earned enough at the very low end to be good parents, then that would be something really worth doing. That, I mean, I'm just letting you know, that was the whole idea um, at the outset, and I said, okay, I can, I was very relieved, obviously, that the topic didn't get onto me and my life. I was delighted, and we thought, okay, let, and this is where, you know, you discover, and the first thing that happened is that, the, you know, just to let you know, we were threatened with legal action, that you couldn't, that somehow or other, it, it was brilliant, it was against EU law at some level to protest against <coughs> the levels of wages. But what I saw over the long period I was engaged, it was 12 years of my life that completely changed my life. You know, I, I ended up very weirdly in the House of Lords at the end of this living wage campaign, um, was that it was church-led. It was absolutely from the beginning. We used to talk a lot about the Muslim participation and the trade union participation, but I'm here to bear witness that in the in the small places that this was won initially. You know, we, we won it, you know, our first campaign was in, a, was in a small hospital in East London, but in the congregations where, that the people trusted the faith communities more than they, they trusted their churches, more than they trusted the state, more than they trusted the unions, more than they trusted their political parties. The leadership came from there, and the, and the people who turned up all the way through came from there. So what you have, I just want to share with you, is, is a remarkable example, but I can't think of another one, where a, an initiative that didn't come from think tanks, it didn't come from you know, policy papers, it didn't emerge from the data, it emerged from the church and was led by the church and carried by the church, has actually led to a situation where a conservative government has acknowledged the limits of the market, that you can't leave the lowest paid at the mercy of, of the market, that there is something um, 
something dignified about work that needs to be respected. And the other thing about the living wage campaign is that when we won it, it was always the case that the cleaners and the cooks and the security guards who were all contracted out were brought back into a body. Into, that's, that's, and it was always the argument that always made a huge impact was about the, you know, something that you maybe don't think about enough but is a huge part of the Christian legacy of the country, which is the Christmas party at work. And we always used to say, who do you invite to your Christmas party? And they always invited the full-time staff, you know, the, the caretakers, you know, in universities, the academics, but they never invited the contracted out staff. So that was how we started to build this thing, was to have inclusive Christmas parties where people would begin, that's the relational side. So the first thing to say, um, really, is, is just, that's what I've seen, just to bear witness in my life, is a campaign on behalf of, of poor workers that was led by those workers, which was supported, nurtured, and absolutely strengthened by the commitment of a whole range of what Jenny talked about, of different churches, of Catholic Church, um, Anglican Church, uh, and non-conformist churches. And I, and I think that you should really reflect on that, because in this time that is coming, that we are in now, it's, very, it's absolutely vital that there is leadership from the church in framing a new political settlement, which I would describe as this common good or towards a covenantal politics rather than a transactional or a contract contractual politics. And I would obviously say to you, you know, don't follow the Labour Party. This is very important. That's not the way to go. Because if there's any institution that's in worse shape at the moment than the Anglican Communion, I would definitely <laughs> say uh, that, that I'm in it. And, um, and, and therefore, you know, clinging on to failed dogma is something that I'm very, very familiar with at the moment. And also, just to reiterate how the common good love is, is so vital, what Jenny just said, you know, you would think sometimes from the conversations that I have to participate in that Tories were not human beings at some level. There's a demonization of, 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 of Tories that, it, that is actually absolutely morally and terribly uh, really, really very, very wrong indeed. And I go further in saying that, which is that, you know, I've talked about it with Malcolm, I think it, it has to go further, is that the church settlement of 45 really is over. The William Temple deal is over. Any new settlement that doesn't involve the leadership of the poor, the active agency of the poor that doesn't stress what Tim was mentioning, which is the absolute duties and obligations of family life, um, that doesn't look at the, the small virtues of honesty, love, faithfulness, trust, that looks only at structural features, will never be transformative. And, and what obviously we've got in Labour is, is that Labour can't get over basically 1945, it can't repent of the administrative, paternalistic, bureaucratic, loveless system that did not, that it, you know, one of the weird things I learned when I got into politics is there are more working class, rep, there's more working class representation in the House of Lords than in the House of Commons. You know, and I wasn't expecting this, you know, there's a group of us who sit at the back, you know, and they're trade union leaders who didn't go to university. And they just keep on saying, and they say to me the whole time, what the hell are they talking about? You know, and this is our side I'm talking about. They, they get up and they talk this language of accessibility, inclusivity, diversity, when, you know, what people know is it's about love and honesty and, and a commitment to, to being good. And that is incredibly difficult. So talking about incentives to virtue rather than incentives to vice is the way ahead. And I'm just sharing with you from my heart that if you get into a demonization of rich people, if you get into a demonization um, of, of capitalism and the market, there will be no transformation in those conditions. And that relationships, the, the common good politics, demands a reconciliation of estranged interests. A crucial area of that is cultural between religious and 
and irreligious. You know, one of the remarkable things that wasn't really picked up about the bishop's document, the pastoral letter. So I can remember, I'm old enough to remember when Catholics and Protestants really did hate each other. You know, I looked at this from the outside, but you didn't want to get involved in that at all. And I remember in Liverpool, Jenny, orange marches and, and I remember, you know, Scots don't like to talk about it, but in Glasgow and in Edinburgh, really hateful. Now, what happened in the bishop's letter was, I thought, a politics of a common good. It drew very heavily on Catholic social thought. And what was astonishing was that people didn't even notice that a remarkable thing has gone on in, in our politics, whereby I think following um, Jenny's dad and the work that he did, that there is a vitally important place for, for Christian leadership in the new, in the new political settlement. Um, and that is, that, is, that is based on that. And so what I want to talk really about in the next bit, before we get on to the specifics, what Tim likes to call the specifics, I hate that bit of the negotiation when you get to specifics. I prefer the general statement of principles, you know. Um, it is, is just to recognise this, this extraordinary thing that you do bring that no one else can bring. And a part of that is a recognition of, of sin. So one of the things that I've noticed since I made this move from working with churches to working um, in the Labour Party is the Labour Party does not recognise the sin within themselves. Everybody else is bad, that's for sure. But an idea that we humiliated people, that we disempowered people, that we can be hateful and exclusive, you know, it's, you know, I, I'm constantly having to justify, they say to me all the time at Constituents Labour Party, why do you work with the, why do you work with the church? As if that, that's an extraordinary, and you know, I, I make a sneaky reply. What I say is, you know, but at least, at least Christians don't think that the free market created the world. I say, you know, and they go, oh. I, I get that, but neither should you think that the state created the world <laughs> is the, is the follow-up, that there's something anterior and prior, and that's, that relates to exactly what the topic is tonight about finance, is that there is a tragic and sinful component in capitalism that has to be recognised. So while I'm absolutely advocating a loving and genuine relationship with business, one of the reasons I do so is that finance capital left to its own devices outside of all relationships. You know, Aristotle said anything outside of relationships and law has a tendency to be either a beast or a god. And in the case of the City of London, I guess we got both. You know, it, it has an enormous power. And what is that power? And this is the key, I think, Tim, to the conversation that we need to have, is that it puts this pressure to turn human beings and nature into a commodity, that there's this pressure to turn what was created and inherited into something that's to be bought and sold. And it, what I say to you is if you know anything, you know that a human being, the story of the prodigal son, you know, that story that you just told is so powerful because to treat people as a commodity, to commodify the body and the soul and the environment we live in leads to degradation. So there has to be a resistance to that in the recognition and the tragic recognition that there also has to be that, that capital brings innovation, that capital brings an openness to strangers, that there is an extremely powerful force. So it's both incredibly destructive and incredibly good. And it's to hold that. It's, it's that tragic paradox that I think is held within your tradition that is so badly needed. And so that's the case with, with finance. And the problem with finance is that if it left to its own way, it would just seek the maximum return on investment. And the maximum return on investment would lead to the lowest possible <coughs> wages and the less possible regulation. And that's why, Tim, it's more complicated in, in, in terms of the development of the global economy. What has never been more needed is an active role for unions and the church in the developing world to uphold that human beings and nature are not to be just treated as commodities, but they're to enter into a relationship. So fundamentally, both capitalism and the state 
sorry to be talking to Tim so directly here, are both unrelational in themselves. They're systems of, of either exploitation, potentially, or directly speaking, oppression. And it's human association, it's congregation, it's love, it's relationships that stops it being so systematic in that sense. And what we need to do is reconstitute um, our politics to recognise that we need to that we need to have far greater strengthening of relationships of love that are rooted in family, rooted in place, and rooted in work. And the and, and that work and labour is of fundamental importance to this. That one of the ways, so one of the things that I think capitalism does is it tries to say that that progress, that efficiency, that improvement is based on the power, on its own power, or on technology and or in education. But the key concept that you carry that has been neglected is that of vocation. That you, there's some, a vocation which I define as good doing rather than do gooding. If you see, it's a way of doing things well in the world, of something inherited from the past where you transform things through your labor. And just to bring you a, a stroke of, I'll, I'll get to the end very soon, but not quite yet. I'm just bringing a, a moment of comfort to you. We did 5,000, it wasn't so far from here, it was in the Northwest. A few years ago, we did 5,000 one-to-ones with people. Um, this was within labor. And what we realized was the average length of time it took for someone to say what they thought and for a Labour Party member, organiser, activist, MP to interrupt them to tell them that they were wrong was eight seconds, right? That was what it took. So someone would say, I'm worried about immigration and we'd say, no, you're not. You're not worried about that. You're worried about education, housing and jobs, right? And they'd say, no, I'm not. And they'd say, yes, you, and then that was, you know, we lost the election for a very, very, very good reason. And that was an absolute inability to listen to people when they were telling us things. And connects absolutely to what I think is the nature of this settlement, this idea of moving away from the 45 settlement and the 79 settlement, but particularly 45, is that the politics that we go to has to be as conservative as it is radical. There is a radical side to this, but anything that doesn't understand the modest virtues, the sense of attachment to family and place, the importance of faithfulness and obligation and duty will we'll miss the point. So what we did was we just asked people. In the end, we couldn't get any change. So as opposed to having an argument, we asked a different question. We did 5,000 one-to-ones as a mean of training to ask people what they cared about. If people I tell you what they care about, it's more difficult to argue with them. It was a matter of learning to listen and to not interrupt for 45 seconds, right? which is quite long in the political cycle, the electoral cycle. <laughs> and what we found when that came out was that by far and away, um, the most important thing to people is their family, right? how to honor their parents. And the humiliation that came out, I mean, these were very moving testimony of how they felt that they couldn't, they, they couldn't take their parents in, they were living away from them, and the fear that they would be abandoned in a home and the fear of the abuse that, and neglect that would go on in those homes. But people still had that sense of absolute obligation to care for their mother and their father, their concern for their children, particular concerns about um, the sexualization of childhood, advertising, these things were very, very strong, but still a huge, and you know, and even a concern with each other, if you can believe such a thing still exists. Uh, so family was way ahead. The second thing that people cared about, which is absolutely relevant, I think, for you, is place, the place they lived in. And the policy community that Tim and I, unfortunately, have to have quite a lot to do with, they think that just the invention of Twitter and an internet connection makes place irrelevant. But it doesn't. People are connected to their places and they feel that they're diminished and degraded by you know, money shops and pound shops and betting shops and, and a lack of a place that people can, can, can get together. And the third thing that people cared about was, was work. Now, what was interesting in my experience, that bringing that back to sort of Labour Party head office, that what, you know, we said, well, what people care about is family, place, and work, to which the answer was, 
No, they don't. No, they don't. What they care about is inequality. And, you know, I said, funnily enough, that wasn't mentioned in these, you know, conversations. But that's what's... There's got to be a very big process where I think um, you'll play a huge role. So just on the very specifics, I think that what we've got to recognise is finance centralises and concentrates power every bit as much as the state. For those of you who are old as me, I can remember the names of institutions that were a bit like football clubs, you know, Bradford and Bingley, Halifax, Leicester. I used to be able, you know, Anglia, East Anglia. I used to be able to kind of recognise my country through its financial institutions. Do you remember the Midland, the Midland Bank? And now, not one of those institutions that was demutualised in the 80s and the 90s is now an independent organisation. We're essentially, it's also an age-specific joke, I, so I'd say we're living in the age of the exorcist, there's six, 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 you know, there's six banks, six energy companies. These are a, a sort of, you know, the age of the oligarchs is upon us. But the point is, unless there's a decentralisation, a redistribution of capital, then there won't be business, there won't be access, there won't be energy, there won't be innovation. Capitals concentrates and centralises every bit as much as the states. So one of the things is to follow Archbishop Justin's lead in recognising that usury is a shocking thing, it's a terrible thing, it's the way that the rich prey upon the vulnerabilities of the poor, but to build and go into partnership with unions, go into partnership with universities in building credit unions that can actually offer, and then politically I think that's the next stage of the thing, is to decentralise capital, to get um, the banks of England, we call them, which, which, can re, which can redistribute capital, because there's got to be a countervailing force to the, to to the centralisation. And secondly, on housing, is that what we found, and when I was doing community organising, I found this in America, working with the Industrial Areas Foundation and Arnie Graf, is that local Christian communities campaigned, for example, in East Brooklyn, which was a terrible, terrible place. But in East Brooklyn, they campaigned for a transfer of the freehold from the city to the churches together in their organisation. Um, and if you transfer the freehold, then you halve the price of building houses. So, if, you know, so as opposed to fighting the cuts, which I think is, um, I, I agree with Tim, if we'd have put the energy into having some asset land transfer, some organising, that's what I mean, you've got to develop the leadership of the poor, then you can build houses without that being a state-directed activity or a market. And I learned an incredibly useful thing, because when we sat down with these really poor people in East Brooklyn to design the houses that they were putting, they did double collection every Sunday to raise the money, and they raised the money to have a serious stake in this, what, where did they want to live? I'm talking about overwhelmingly African-American community in East Brooklyn, Puerto Rican. What were the houses that they wanted? They basically wanted a townhouse with a front garden and a back garden. That was another breakthrough for me, to recognise that we want the same things, a beautiful place to live with other people in peace. But the real sting in the tail was when they got control of the bylaws there was an absolute prohibition on loud music late at night, violence, and, you know, there, it was extremely associative, let's say, and there were obligations. And 10,000 houses they built in East Brooklyn, and the queue to get on it is huge. But that idea that people actually governing their own lives, having a stake in the game, it was an enormous asset transfer for people, but they raised the money and they did it. So I'm speaking too long and I'm really sorry, so I've got to end up with this. Um, don't, forget, don't forget what you know. And don't forget that, that life is genuinely beautiful and tragic. That, that the fight to have the good is always going to come across interests. It's always going to be difficult, but that is our obligation to understand that there isn't a utopia ahead, but there is beauty, there is good, and that the forces of love and faithfulness and trust take ages to build, are very difficult to build, but are beautiful when they happen. But what we found in doing on the policy review for the last election is that we were doing this work on place, and it still is the case that 
English people from wherever they're from, including immigrants, still think they live in the parish map of 1532 rather than the local authority map of 1964. They still think they live in counties. They, nobody we spoke to thought they lived in South Humberside or Medway or any of these places. They also don't recognise the large city things. They recognise the parish map, the village map, in London terms that they live in Stoke Newington or Stamford Hill or Dalston, not in Hackney. They live in specific areas which are always named after the churches that they're in. That the imagination of the country, you still hold it. So this is a very important thing when you think about your, your leadership. So I just want to say really thank you for inviting me and I think that there are really very challenging but very good times ahead. Thank you.